Hey, good morning folks. Welcome to another episode with Montana Outdoor Science School. My name is Melanie. I'm one of the instructors here at Moss. Today's topic is about rodents and their role in nature, uh, particularly how they're really beneficial to ecosystems across the planet. If at some point any of you have any questions, feel free to type into the comment section. I uh, would love to hear from you guys. Also, notice I am outside today. It is really lovely out, so I thought I'd take this project outside instead of being indoors. Uh, if for some reason it's hard to hear or it's hard to see what I'm doing because I'm outdoors, please feel free to type that into the comments as well. I can switch really easily to going from being out here on my patio to going back indoors where it isn't quite so uh, potentially blustery or noisy. Otherwise, um, Moss is an organization, we, uh, a nonprofit organization, we try to get kids excited and interested in science. We want them to be curious about the world, so we do uh, summer camps that are science-based. We do all kinds of school programs where students either come to us or we go to schools. We also have many activities that are involved in all those programs uh, from science experiments, science games, science knowledge, field trips that get kids outdoors trying to explore uh, the Gallatin Valley here or the Paradise Valley if you're part of the Livingston camps. Um, so we do a lot of uh, a lot of work to try to just get kids excited about nature and outdoors and science. Um, but I'm gonna get started with my uh, rodent talk today. I'm very excited about this one because we have a lot of rodent skulls. I'm excited to show everybody all the little rodent skulls. Again, if anybody has a hard time hearing, please let me know. Um, I'm outdoors today just because it's so nice out and I want to show everybody uh, these skulls while I'm out here. But that is a rodent skull right there. You'll notice it's very different than what we have been looking at uh, in the past. I did do one beaver, um, beaver video that was probably, gosh, that was like the second video that I ever did was a beaver video. Um, so we've seen similar skulls to this, but it's been a little while. Most of the skulls we've been looking at, of, of course, had teeth like this one. And that is the most noticeable difference between these two skulls, is those teeth. Uh, the Pine Martin here has those itty bitty little canines. Check out those back teeth. They're super duper sharp, just like any other carnivore might have. That is a predator for sure. Um, unfortunately, his incisors fell out and are no longer with us, but you can see just how big those canines are in comparison to the rest of him. He has huge canines. Whereas our little rodent friend here, this is a muskrat. The rodent does not have any incisors that look like uh, that carnivore there, or for that part, or for uh, that part an herbivore. Instead, they have these really, really long incisors. And this is what is key about rodents. Rodents have incisors that are ever growing, constantly growing, and also needing to be worn down to prevent them from harming them in turn. Um, <clears throat> rodents do this by chewing on lots and lots and lots of vegetation. Uh, vegetation tends to be kind of a difficult thing for animals to eat up. We see with herbivore skulls how their molars over time wear down. Same thing with rodent skulls, but the incisors particularly will wear down because of them chewing on vegetation, uh, whether it be stems, sticks, twigs, leaves, uh, trees, if it's a beaver, all kinds of things uh, mean that the, uh, oops, the rodent needs the ability to uh, regrow those teeth because they're going to wear down fast. But just because they wear down and because they're growing often doesn't mean that they aren't strong. Notice too that these are very, very orange in appearance and that's not because they're dirty. I have a lot of students say, oh, it's because uh, they haven't cleaned their teeth or they can't clean their teeth. And it's like, well, not entirely so. Reason that it's not white like our other little skull here is because there is um, extra iron in the enamel of the rodent tooth. Uh, excuse me, rodent teeth. So how that works is, if you can imagine a rusty nail, uh, it uh, starts to kind of turn orange or red when it's exposed to oxygen, whether that's oxygen in the air, oxygen in the water. Uh, it starts to get that red color. It goes from being uh, a dark metal to being a bright red metal. Um, our blood is red because some proteins in our blood have iron, and thus our blood has a more reddish tint to it. 
um, but with rodent teeth, the orange is because of that iron again. It's oxidized a little bit. It's exposed to oxygen somewhat, so it becomes a little bit more orange, a little bit more red in color, um, and this ends up uh, turning darker and darker, I suppose, too, over time. But it uh, makes it stronger. You can imagine that with the added benefit of another type of mineral, another type of metal in their teeth, that's going to make those teeth nice and strong for them. So ever-growing teeth, always being worn down, but they are very strong, especially due to that iron uh, in them to help them take on that orangish color. So that one's a muskrat uh, skull, and that one's actually really nice. I'm gonna pull out one of my other skulls I've got here. Make sure I've got the right ones. Da, 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 da. Ooh, I have a really good example of a tooth that really grew very, very long on this creature. Um, let me remember which one it is. This one, oh, this one is also a muskrat too. So this one's a muskrat. The skull's a slightly different color because of the way it was uh, taxidermy, the way it was treated. Different processes might mean that uh, the grease inside bones will come out to the surface. This one doesn't feel greasy, but the yellow uh, is a kind of grease aspect of how this one was cured. Um, doesn't mean it's dirty necessarily, it's just something that happens to skulls. Um, but check out that really, really long tooth. These teeth curl inward, uh, and if I can show you guys the bottom jaw, I only have a section of it just because it is such a fragile little skull. The bottom and top incisors are able to touch each other and wear each other down. Uh, in this case though, it seems like the top set was able to grow a little further than maybe anticipated. It might also be, let me t check it's not this. Sometimes these teeth are really fun to take in and out and they come out really easily. Oh, maybe, ah, here we go. It could also be that this tooth is uh, just out of its socket a little bit. So that's the root of those teeth. That's pretty cool. I'm gonna see if I can slip it back right in there. It's always fun to show kids that, but it also tends to be the reason we lose a lot of rodent teeth uh, with our collection there. If anybody has any questions, feel free to type that into the comments, or if you're having any trouble hearing me at all, I am outside. Uh, I just wanna make sure people can hear me. Let me know in the comments section too. Uh, so again, another muskrat skull there for you to take a look at. I'll set him off to the side. And then there's the little one I wanted to pull out. Wow, I have a lot of muskrats. I'm very excited about how many muskrats I have. Uh, if you want a comparison of clean skull versus very dirty skull, this is another skull that wasn't uh, cured. This one was just left out and somebody found it and you can see how much more dirty that is. And you can also see into the uh, nasal cavity just how dark and dirty that is too. But that's another muskrat. So many muskrats. I'm looking for my other uh, example that I wanted everyone to be able to see. I had a very, very tiny skull. What I wish I had is a vole skull because voles are super prevalent here in Montana. Um, even just outside in my backyard, I have a little marshland back there. There's a ton of voles living out there and you can find them in the, uh, uh, based on all the trails that are running around throughout the place. Um, they leave quite a few spots where they'll either build up their stores for winter or even just the opposite of that, they build up their, uh, their scat, scat piles uh, as well. I found quite a few after the snow melted this winter. Um, let's see. Ooh, I've got some good ones here for you guys. Some big old skulls. Let's take away the dirty one. I'll keep that nice one in the background. And then check out this one. So size has increased hugely here. Uh, this one, oh, I gotta check which one this is. Let's see. This one, I wanna say is either a porcupine or a beaver. This one's a beaver. But again, you can see that we've lost some of the teeth on here. They do become fragile as time goes on. They tend to not have uh, any um, any uh, way to keep the teeth from totally decaying all the way. Ooh, I see a question. Let me take a look at what the question is. Um, are there any invasive species of rodents in Montana? That's a really good question. I am almost positive there is. Unfortunately, I don't know which ones there are, but I can talk a little bit about some of the native species and why they're super important 
important for Montana. Um, and not even just Montana, but rodents in general and how important they are for, uh, for ecosystems. So with beavers and muskrats, they take a huge role in being a keystone species, especially the beaver. Uh, the beaver tends to change the environment in which it lives in because it is taking apart trees, because it's uh, changing waterways, it's affecting how an environment is actually built. This allows all that water to accumulate, which allows for uh, ponds that are nice and still, which allows for growth of fish, insects, um, the piling of wood and the piling of uh, debris allows for flatland to be created, which in turn allows for uh, birds then to be able to find nesting areas. So beavers are extremely important in that sense. And muskrats too. Muskrats don't quite have the same uh, grand effect that beavers do. Beavers can really take things to a large scale because they build dams. Muskrats don't build dams, but they do uh, flatten areas that are marshy. So I actually found a muskrat, a dead muskrat, um, last summer over in some different marshes near my home. And these marshes uh, do have quite a bit of flatland area and there are a ton of birds now. There's red-winged blackbirds, there's geese out there right now, there's a few species of ducks, uh, and they're all able to find nesting grounds because of the muskrat having made flat areas where cattails and where birds can nest and such. Um, so that's muskrats and beavers, very important species. And I wish I had an example skull of this, but another super important species in more the plains area, uh, that eastern side of Montana, is prairie dogs. Prairie dogs are super important. We have uh, always kind of applied the idea that in, in human society, rodents are pests, and maybe for us that might be true. They can be a nuisance, especially if they get into food stores, if they uh, start to accumulate in population, uh, it can be a problem. However, in nature, it's very, very critical to have a large population of rodents because they are at the bottom oftentimes of a food chain. They need to be able to uh, uh, sustain other populations of species and one of those is prairie dogs. Prairie dogs are eaten by a innumerable number of predators elsewhere. This is coyotes, it could be wolves, it could be uh, all kinds of raptors. I think Montana has something like, gosh, I want to say around a dozen raptors native to here. And all those raptors are more than capable of eating uh, rodents and prairie dogs especially. Um, what else is there? Uh, we've got lynx, we've got bobcat, we've got ferrets. Oh, this is what I was building up to. So black-footed ferrets. Let me see if I have a ferret skull. I know I have a pine marten skull. I can pull that out somewhere. Um, but ferrets are super important, in, or I'm sorry, they are endangered species, and part of the reason why is because they don't get uh, the same habitat that they used to. They also don't have the same uh, feasting grounds, I guess is a way you could put it. They don't have the same numbers of prairie dogs to be able to eat, which has in turn affected their populations. This isn't a pine mart, or I'm sorry, this isn't a ferret, a black-footed ferret, but this is a pine marten, which is about the same size. It lives in the same, uh, or is a part of the same family as ferrets, so it does have a similar shape and a similar uh, uh, role in its ecosystem. But a ferret, essentially, uh, it needs to have the burrows as well as those rodents that the rodents build. Uh, rodents are super important for building tunnels out on the prairie land, and because those, uh, those uh, tunnels are there, species like ferrets can take shelter in those tunnels. They're not the only species that does this though. Um, there are bird species, there are reptile, amphibian species that take residence in these tunnels that prairie dogs have made, and then they're able to survive, especially if you've ever thought about this, grass fires. Grass fires can be extremely dangerous if you're extremely small, but having a tunnel in which to escape to is critical. So prairie dogs make a ton of tunnels, even if they don't occupy those tunnels anymore, um, those tunnels remain and are very, very important for that spe or for uh, other species. Um, Black-footed ferrets, at one point, it was believed they were extinct. They ended up being reintroduced into the wild from uh, from a captive bred populations. Now they are recovering. They're still threatened, very threatened, um, but they are recovering in a great big way. 
Da, 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 da. Oh, I appreciate that comment. Every animal and insect is important. I believe that too, for sure. I had my students ask me recently uh, at one of the schools I was visiting, they said, uh, what they say? One of the students asked, he's like, do, are there any animals you dislike, Miss Mel? And I said, you know, I don't think there are. And I had to think about why. And, and the answer is just, they all have a role to play. They all uh, deserve a spot in nature. They all deserve to keep uh, living their way of life. And so there really isn't any animals that I dislike. So thanks for that comment. I appreciate that, everybody. Again, if you have any questions or any uh comments you want to make, feel free to type that into the comment section. I love hearing from folks on the internet. Um, da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. I'm looking through the comments section real quick. I also, ooh, let me see if I can find, ooh, friends, I have an even bigger beaver skull. Check it out. So we've got our little muskrat skull, my best and probably cleanest example of a rodent skull I have. Got the bigger beaver one, but this one, check that out. That one's even more huge. My goodness. So that is a beaver skull for y'all to take a look at. Beavers are the biggest rodents in North America, followed closely by porcupines. I thought I had a porcupine skull. Let me see if I can pull that out for you. Uh, porcupines have a similar, um, ha uh, they do similar things with their teeth that beavers do. They're chewing through wood. They're chewing through the soft outer bark of trees to try to take up uh, nutrients from those inner twigs. Let's see. I'm trying to find my porcupine skull for you guys. I have, like I said, I have so many skulls. Oh, I found it. Oh, exciting. So here's my little porcupine skull that I have too. And it, you can see it's a little bit different. I'm gonna take the big one away for just a moment. I'm gonna take this medium one here. So this is a comparison of beaver versus porcupine, everybody. Check it out. So the beaver right over here has these arches, these zygomatic arches that uh, just go straight to the back of his skull versus over here, the porcupine has, um, you know, I'm not sure the technical science term, but it has uh, an arch that is lower uh, down here. So if you ever find a porcupine or a beaver skull and you're not sure which one it is, look for that arch that's on the bottom there and you can tell the difference between those two. Um, again, beavers are a keystone species, super important in their ecosystem. They change the environment, which allows for more creatures to inhabit uh, wetland areas. Super important species. Porcupines, um, I wouldn't, I'm not sure if I would say they're a keystone species, but nevertheless, they're just as important in their habitat. Uh, they need to be uh, thought of as a key species. I suppose you could think of all species as key species in a way. They all have their roles to play. Um, I wanted to mention about smaller rodents though. I have students sometimes find or look at tiny skulls and they think, oh, it's so tiny, it must be a rodent. And let me show you all my example I have right now. I have a tiny, tiny skull. So this is a least weasel. Least weasels, I'm pretty sure, are actually, you know, I'm not even, I don't know if I should mention much about least weasels because I, I have a, a thought on it, but I'm not sure if it's correct. But least weasel, check out that tiny, tiny little face. Those are carnivore teeth right there. Carnivore teeth on such a tiny animal. Um, and if you compare it, I mean, even to our muskrat skull, it's way smaller. Nevertheless, it's a carnivore. So sometimes I get students asking, well, why is, a uh, why isn't it a rodent? It's like, well, you have to look at the teeth. If it has those incisors that are ever growing that have the orange enamel on them, uh, then you can, uh, be sure that it's a rodent. But least weasel definitely has carnivorous teeth, definitely isn't a rodent, doesn't have those ever-growing incisors. I remembered what the other thing was I wanted to bring out. So I actually had a huge misconception for a long time myself. Um, for a long time, I thought that rabbits were part of the rodent family. And I actually had a student correct me on this many years ago now. Uh, the student had mentioned how rabbits don't have the orange uh, incisors on the front. And it got me realizing that that's because they're not rodents technically. Instead, they're what are called lagomorphs. 
uh, lagomorph is similarly related to rodents. They do still have ever-growing incisors on uh, the top jaw and the bottom jaw. However, they have a little bit of a different, um, a different, uh, uh, I guess, anatomy to it. So once again, on the rodents, we've got the orange ever-growing teeth. Let me get that to be focused. There we go. Uh, orange ever-growing teeth, top, bottom set, two on each side. Uh, two for the top, two for the bottom. On a lagomorph though, or rabbit family, they have two sets on the top and one set on the bottom. So on this one, it's a little more difficult to see than the next one. I'll show you guys the next set. But those are the front two incisors. And then behind those front two incisors, they have another set of two incisors. And what this does is it allows for sort of a uh, chopping motion. If their top jaw has one set of incisors and another set, their bottom jaw can come in, oops, sorry everyone, their bottom jaw with its incisors can come in and snip and it goes right between the top two uh, sets of incisors. Unfortunately, none of my lagomorph uh, skulls have, uh, um, have a bottom jaw, which is too bad, but I'll show you all on this one. This one's a, a snowshoe hare, and it's a lot bigger than my other one back here. This one I think is just like a, it's a common one. It's like a cotton tail. It's not something that uh, is difficult to find, but the snowshoe hare here has incredibly immense size, and it also has a really good example on the skull of those holes. I'm trying to get it to focus for you guys. There we go. It's a little better. So you can see the two top holes for the front incisors, but behind those ones, check it out, there's two more holes, and those are for the back incisors on the top jaw. So all together, rabbits have six sets of, or I'm sorry, six incisors, three sets, two on the top and one on the bottom, which is different than rodents who have one set on the top and one set on the bottom. So that was something I learned uh, by a student, actually. I had the misconception that day that uh, ro or rabbits are not rodents. They are lagomorphs, that they do have ever-growing teeth, but they have a different setup, and that is what distinguishes them from rodents. So I thought that would be worth sharing with you all. It was a pretty neat find. And their teeth are also white. I don't know if y'all saw that on those little cottontail teeth there, but they are white. They don't have the same uh, iron encased enamel that uh, rodents do. So there's the ro or there's the rabbits. Here's a muskrat again. And for comparison, here's a pine martin. You can check out how its size and teeth compare. Here's the big beaver. Put that into the background again. So many skulls, love it. Uh, let me take a look at where we're at. So thanks for tuning in everybody. Um, would love to keep hearing you guys, from you guys in the comments section over time. We will be doing another, um, another live stream video on Friday at 11 a.m. Uh, the live stream for that day is gonna be the rock cycle, which will be very fun. I'm really excited for it. I'm gonna pull out um, some supplies and actually do a little bit more of a, something that's a little bit more of like an activity that you in turn would be able to bring to your home and outdoors onto your, uh, out, uh, outside your house if you wanted to do um, the same thing, but I won't give all the details away. Thanks for joining us today though, everyone. Hope you learned a little something about rodents and lagomorphs and, uh, other roles that those creatures may play in their environment. Super important to their ecosystems, super necessary all around. Oh, I should end on my last note. This is what I want to say. Not only are they important for, uh, the nature, for, uh, ecosystems out, um, outside, but they're also really important for people. So I mentioned, I remember in the beaver video a long time ago now, how beavers were often an important uh, commodity in the fur trade. We've used rodents for clothing. We've used them for food. We've used them for, uh, for laboratory experiments. I mean, all kinds of research that is done in modern science has only been able to be uh, applied because we have mice that we are able to use use to uh, uh, test those experiments and to be able to better our society. So 
Rodents are important even in our culture too, not just in nature. And I wanted to end on that. So everybody, thanks for joining us. We will see you on Friday. Um, until then, get outside and go do something fun.